you know, I, I understand the appeal of dating apps. We, we're in 2019 and everyone is too busy to go out all the time or, you know, join a uh, singles club or, or what, I, I guess they don't really have those anymore. Uh, what is it called? Speed dating. If they do that, um, never done that. That, that could be kind of fun where you go like table to table, uh, <laughs> having like 90 second conversations. So, so not everyone has time for that. So I, I see why dating apps are appealing but it feels like a very transactional exercise, which is why more often than not, it doesn't work out. Because I, I feel like that because there's not much investment, right? If you, you know, if people are more likely to flake when, when there's not, a, when, when there's not a lot at stake, right? If you promise a friend that you'll go, go with him or her to a concert on Saturday, but you haven't bought your ticket and then you're not feeling great, Saturday morning, maybe you're hungover. You'll be like, you know what? I didn't, I didn't buy this ticket. Yeah, I think I'll just, I'll just skip it. Whatever. But if you bought that ticket, guys, if you already mentally prepared yourself to go to that concert, even if it's raining and you're sick and hungover, you'll drag your ass to that concert because you invested in it. In psychology, the the concept is the sunk cost fallacy. If you already invested in something, you are more likely to follow through with it in order to justify your previous investment. And with dating apps, you know, you meet someone on app, you talk, exchange a couple messages, there's not a lot of investment, right? Let's say I meet a girl on a dating app and we exchange a couple messages back and forth and, you know, we make plans to get drinks on the weekend. Um, if, if I'm not feeling up to it, as I said, with the concert example, I could just bow out, no harm, no foul. After all, you know, it's just just Tinder. Yeah, you know, I don't even I don't even know this person, right? People people probably flake all the time, right? Not to mention the fact that I haven't met her, so she's just a an abstract hologram, you know, floating behind on the other side of a computer screen. There's no you know interpersonal connection. There's no face to face. There's no voice. Um, it's not real. Contrast that with, you know, say we met in. I don't know, a bookstore, spoke for a couple minutes, then you gave me your number and, you know, uh, we made plans to get drinks over the weekend. I wouldn't feel so great about flaking on you now. You know, like, first of all, I'm excited to see you because we met face to face. Um, you know, I know what you look like. I know what you sound like. Also, I probably feel guilty because I have some, like, uh, visual imagery on the person that's on the other end of the conversation. It's, it's not abstract anymore, guys. It's concrete. So that's, to me, that's the my first major issue with dating apps is the transactional nature of it. Um, and because there's no investment, you, sent, you, you tend to see a lot of people flaking. You know, fl- by the way, flake, da- dating apps have introduced a lot of words into the uh, the colloquial language of dating now, like flaking. Like when I was a kid, I, I don't even think flake was a thing. You know, oh, this person flaked, right? We didn't say that. Or um, ghosting. Ghosting is huge now. If you, you know, hang out with someone or date, you know, go on a date with them, you sleep with them, whatever, and then you disappear, you're ghosting. That, that's another thing. That's... And the, the other problem with dating apps is a problem of, um, of, kind of uh, a lack of sincerity that nobody is who they say they are. And this this is, you know, goes without saying, but everyone on on the dating apps is trying to curate their best image, right? Their their best photos, their their wittiest um uh you know, lines in their bio. And very rarely does a person end up meeting your expectation of what what you expect them to look like, what you expect them to act like, what their personality, right, ends up being. The, the catfish is a real thing. And that's another word, by the way, along with flake and ghost. Catfish is another, another word that um, has uh, you know, joined uh, the, the lore of popular culture with dating. And for my older listen, listeners, I think my parents might listen to the podcast, um, so, you know, friends and family who are a little older. Catfishing is when two people meet online and one person ends up being dramatically different from how they presented themselves. So maybe they used old pictures, right? Like from five years ago. Uh, maybe they, they put on a little weight since then. Um, you know, maybe uh, they came off as very outgoing in their profile or their personality, but they're they're more shy. Maybe they, they lied about their hobbies. Guys lie about their height all the time. Um, things like that. And then they show up for the date, and there's just a huge clash between 
expectations and reality. And that, my friends, is a catfish. Uh, I think MTV even had a reality show about that, No, uh, though I never checked it out. Whereas if you meet someone in person, you already know what they look like, right? You can't catfish someone if, if you've met them before. Uh, it can be very difficult to make the approach and even tougher to get, you know, get rejected. Uh, I, personally, you know, in my life, and, and I always tell this to my friends, I, I, you know, I like to, to push myself to lean into the discomfort, to do things that make me uncomfortable, make me scared, um, even if it means getting rejected or, or, you know, getting my feelings hurt, just because then, you know, you, you grow from it, you learn from it. Um, and you don't, ha you don't have to regret never having acted, you know, uh, another reference I'm going to make is, uh, Jeff Bezos. You've probably heard of him. He's the, um, CEO of, uh, of Amazon, richest guy alive. And, uh, he, his guiding philosophy in life is the regret minimization framework, which is the idea that you have to live your life as someone who's at the end of his life, looking back, wondering, you know, with every decision, what outcome or what decision can I make that will lead me to the fewest regrets in the future? The regret minimization framework.